When I run for mayor, I run for the entire town. I have to get support from everybody. And since I have to earn all that, I would think that my vote would have a little bit more power, which it currently doesn't. So the strong mayor power kind of levels the playing field a little bit. It helps me move my mandate forward a little bit easier. Hello, Ajax. Thank you for tuning in to Live with Mayor Collier. I'm your host, Devin Jarvis, the Supervisor of Communications and Engagement. And joining me here today for our discussion is my colleague, Sam Patterson, the Town Strategic Initiative Coordinator for Government Relations and, of course, Mayor Sean Collier. Mayor Collier's community engagement series called Live with Mayor puts a modern spin on the traditional town hall. To kick off the 2024 year, we're introducing a new format, a specialty video podcast. Keep listening to learn more about what it's like to be mayor and Mayor Collier's journey on Ajax Council. Strong Mayor Powers community safety, and exciting accomplishments and initiatives. Thank you for joining us today for Live with Mayor Collier 2024 podcast edition. Thank you for joining us here today, Mayor Collier. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. So to get started here today, we're going to be walking through a series of questions uh, with the mayor. And the way we receive these questions are, they're based off of town priorities and common questions that the mayor often receives. So I think before we get into those really detailed questions though, uh, Mayor Collier, I would like to ask you a little bit of an easier one to get to know you a little bit more. And um, what was your journey on Ajax Council? How did you become mayor? And what does your role as mayor really look like day to day? Oh, wow. Okay. So we need a history. <laughs> it is a little bit of a long one. We need one. a history lesson here because <laughs> I'm in my 21st year. So in 2002, I was approached by a group asking me if I would consider to run. At the time, I had my accounting practice here in town. I was involved in the community. I was on the BIA, Ajax Home Week, a few other things. And um, I looked into it and I was pretty involved. Like I was reviewing the budgets for the town and everything mm -hmm. else. And right. I, I didn't love some of the things I was seeing. So I guess I put my mine <laughs> you were a concerned forward. citizen yep. and uh, and I ran and I won by less than one percent I think I won by 57 votes in November wow. of 2003 okay. so I did two terms as local council two terms as regional council uh, from 2010 to 2018 and then 2018 I was elected mayor this is my second term and um, as of November 11th uh, that was the completion of 21 years on wow. Ajax council uh, that's an incredible an incredible journey really and um, for maybe those who might be listening and might not really know about local politics what is your real role as mayor like what is what does the mayor do at a municipality well I am the head of council so mm -hmm. I am basically the CEO of the corporation okay. I um, try and keep uh, try and provide some some leadership and some guidance to, to councillors especially the new ones coming in um, with the changes that the province just brought in with strong mayor powers, it, mm -hmm. it gives me a lot more latitude to sort of, I mean, to be honest, I mean, my platform in 2018 was almost, was most people's platforms that ran mm -hmm. and all about economic development and growth for the most part. And it's, it's allowed me to sort of move that forward a lot easier because again, that's, that is, I guess g the general barometer of what the residents are looking for mm -hmm. is what the mayor's platform is. So it's, it's been working well and, I think I was the first to use the strong mayor's powers in, in, in the province yeah, I think when you're we correct. got them. There's only 29 of us that have that. Have that and yeah. some of them flat out said they're not using it. I found it to be very, very useful to help cut red tape and move things forward and, and progress development. Perfect. And I think we're going to talk about strong mayor powers a little bit more um, later on in the, in the discussion. But before we get there... Um, I do want to talk about a little bit of a recent topic, and it's the budget process. Mm -hmm. um, so could you maybe share with listeners some of the highlights of the 2024 budget and what that process looks like, and maybe any misconceptions that you'd like to share? Well, again, let's go back a couple of years. We've just got through COVID. Things are getting mm -hmm. back to normal. Uh, things are a lot different today than they were two, three years ago, mm -hmm. as far as costs, as far as labor, as far as everything. Just everything is just more expensive. And it's been a real challenge because, you know, last year inflation was, I think, 8-ish eight, percent or something. And um, we managed to bring in a budget of 2.47, which is not easy. I, I spent, I don't know how many, well over 40 hours reviewing this budget, working mm -hmm. with staff. And I, I looked at it from an approach, and, and I'm an accountant by trade, so 
I mean, I looked at it from an approach of what we need to have and what we want to have. And I, I got rid of a lot of the wants. I kept the needs. There were some, a lot of projects I, I pushed out because I didn't feel we needed them right now. Okay. Um, and then there were some, like the Hunt Street extension and the mm -hmm. design that, that is sort of integral to unlock our downtown core that I moved forward. Right. Um, and and it, it's a balance, but I ended up taking out more than I put in and we got it down under our spending caps, under the financial sustainability plan. And um, the way the new budget works under the strong mayor powers is it's my budget, so I brought it forward and then council had the opportunity to make any amendments that they wanted. Uh, there were a couple of very minor ones and then I would have the opportunity to veto them if I didn't agree with them, I agreed with them. So at that point, the budget is passed. So it really was a very efficient uh, process as well. Normally, we're not done the budget process till near the middle or end of February. We are done January 15th. And very collaborative, too, I think. It wasn't, I mean, it was the mayor's budget, but it wasn't yeah. just you running away with a pen and paper and deciding what you wanted on it. Like you said, you worked really closely with staff to get yeah. it done. There was, I don't think, any changes that I made that I did not review with staff first and, and discuss and saying, okay, what about this? What, and, and you know, I wasn't wrong in a few of those. So <laughs> it, it did work out. And, and it, it, it's a good news budget because it's, it's an expansion of services. It's not just a status quo, just let's keep doing what we're doing. We are just on the cusp of significant growth in the town of Ajax and really going to take off. We need to get some of this infrastructure in place to be able to allow for that growth and, and have places for these new people to go and, and, and to be able to move us forward. Right. And um, Mayor Collier, maybe you could talk a little bit more about some of the um, pressures that we're facing as a municipality and is our other municipalities facing similar pressures? Um, and I know residents are often concerned about property taxes mm -hmm. and them increasing year by year. Can you explain that a little bit of why that happens? Yeah, well, realistically, property taxes are always going to increase. It's right. not reasonable. I, I was thinking about this yesterday. I drove by the gas station. I thought, should I fill up? And it was 137. And then this morning, I drove by the same gas station. It's 147. Mm -hmm. right. You know that that's the reality of today. We have we have a unionized environment. We have 600 employees at the town of Ajax. About half of them are unionized. Um, there's collective agreements. Right. So there's never a year when we start the budget process where we're starting at zero. If we this year we hired 12 new firefighters, right. okay, but we don't hire them till July, because you know that that's the time it takes to go through the process. So we're only paying them for half a year this year. So next year we have to annualize those payments. So we're starting at about one and a half percent next year just for the 12 firefighters we hired this year. Right. And right. that's reality and that's what I try and, and get residents to understand through things like this to explain that to them. Um, collective agreements are another one. Mm -hmm. You know, um, often it's not even our decision when it comes to these. Like if, if there's, uh, if it goes to arbitration, an arbitrator will make the decision. They don't make that decision on what the increase should be based on what they think the municipality can pay. They just make the decision. And quite honestly, if uh, a municipality out in the West End, for instance, makes a decision on their fire or their police collective agreements that is higher, all the rest try and rise to that level. And it makes it difficult for all of us. So there's, there's a lot of pressures. We, we experience the exact same as everybody else operating their homes. Instead of, but instead of buying f groceries, for instance, that have gone mm -hmm. up, we, ha we have fuel, we have insurance, we have all these other things that have gone up too. You've also recently uh, taken over the role as chair of the Ontario Big City Mayor's mm -hmm. Municipal Finance Subcommittee. Yes. Uh, yes. And I think about those pressures as well. You sat at a table yesterday with uh, a number of mayors talking about some of those things that municipalities are, are looking after that maybe aren't necessarily something that would traditionally be thought of as a municipal issue. Yeah, it's definitely time for the federal and provincial governments to step up and take back the, the things that they are responsible for funding, like hospitals. Okay, they fund the capital for the hospitals, but it's up to, up to the municipalities. And in Durham Region, we fund 7.5%. So the regional budget is about 7% this year projected. And... Of that, I think $48 million is going to hospital funding. That's not our responsibility. That's a provincial responsibility. Um, social housing, the homeless situation, it's costing the region of Durham right now a million dollars a month to house all of the uh, asylum seeker slash refugees that have come. Right. Uh, many of them, the federal government has brought in, and um, because the funding's not there, they've come from Toronto to here, we're paying a million dollars a month 
for that, that's a federal responsibility. That should not be downloaded to municipalities. And social housing, we are the only, we are the only province in Canada where social housing is at the municipal level, not at the provincial mm -hmm. level. They need to step up and take ownership of these and take these back and take them off the property taxpayer. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about things like the HST. So in the past couple of years, we've seen prices go up enormously. And when prices go up, the HST also comes up. So the federal government has been receiving huge increases in the revenue they're getting from that form of taxation. Meanwhile, we, our property taxes, are static. They don't go up. The only way they can go up is we make them go up. So if we budget at the start of the year for X and we do a road and that road instead of being a million dollars that we budgeted is two million dollars, we have no mechanism to try and make that up. Right. Except for to go back and increase taxes to do it. So, you know, it, it's difficult, but in order to make all these things work, we need to work well with our upper levels of government as well. And we need to be paying for the things we're responsible for. And on that similar train of thought, there's been a lot of discussions, um, whether it's in the news, um, you know, on community groups, on social media, about other provincial legislation that's been introduced. Um, how does that affect municipal finances? Do you have any examples of legislation? Yes, I, I do have a yeah. few. And we've coined that the pills, the yes. provincial, yeah. what is it? The provincially... Provincial impact impact local levy local levy yes. Pill. Yes. right and these are these are things that we have to now pay because of changes made by upper levels of government whether intentionally or just unintended consequences so uh, the most obvious one is um, Bill 109 and Bill 23 right. Bill 109 I think made changes to the planning where if we don't process things in a timely manner we have to refund our planning fees but what it doesn't consider is the fact that we don't control it often the developer controls it and if they're slow we still have to refund our planning fees. Right. That's not really fair. I can talk about Bill 23 cutting development charges. So fine, they want to accelerate housing, that's fine. However, just cutting development charges based on one and two bedroom units doesn't really accelerate the housing because there's no mechanism in place to make sure that those savings to the developer actually get passed on to the people that buy and rent those homes or those condos. However, the municipalities we collect that money to build new roads, to build new rec centers, to hire more firefighters, to do all these DC related things, and we don't have it now. So again, we only have one source of revenue, and that is the taxpayer. It's a challenge. So yeah, I don't so know where, what we do about that. Absolutely, um, and those are all great points, and I think those are the types of questions that residents are looking to hear in a more yep. nuanced discussion like this. And um, maybe stemming off of that conversation and um, about the mayor's budget and those matters and your introduction a little bit there, maybe we should talk a little bit more about those strong mayor powers and um, what misconceptions are out there right now. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. So it's a, it's a tool, but it doesn't sort of give me carte blanche to just, just do whatever the heck I want. It right. doesn't work that way. Um, I still need consensus of council, it's, but all it does is instead of needing three people to support me, I need two. Now, I, th I think that's fair because when I run for mayor, I run for the entire town. Right. I have to get support from everybody versus, and no disrespect to local or regional councillors, but they're only running in one third of the ward, right? And, and since I have to earn all that, I would think that my vote would have a little bit more power, which it currently doesn't. So the strong mayor power kind of levels the playing field a little bit it helps me move my mandate forward um, a little bit easier, but I still need to work and get consensus with council. So uh, I've been able to use that in a number of different ways when we're doing things like policies, like we just are gonna be pa just passed a number of policies to do with our, our, um, our new debt policy and debenturing yeah. policy and our new investment strategy because we have, you know, I don't know how many million in, in, in our reserve funds, 130 or something in reserves, which is what we use to fund capital going forward. But it's incumbent on me and our council to get those investments working for us. If we leave that money sitting in the bank making 2%, meanwhile the market's making 10%, I have to go back to the residents for that 8%. So if we can get those working better for us, again, it, it's, gonna, it's gonna help in the long run. I want to make changes to those policies. It allows me to very easily make changes to those policies through Mayor's Directive. Things like the 260-story towers that we approved over on Westney. Right. 
Um, instead of going through the planning process, no disrespect to planners, but it is slow, um, allowed me to do a mayor's directive very quickly. Mm -hmm. Instead of going through a full official plan review to look at reduce or increasing heights, reducing parking, and, and increasing densities, I was able to do it through a mayor's directive. And, and get it done in a month, what would, could have taken a year going through an official plan review and a zoning bylaw amendment. But still being able to take into consideration things like um, where it's located in, in our, yes. our GO station area um, or the fact that, you know, you've put in there that it needs to have a grocery store and yes. daycare and the services that wrap around to support something of that height and density. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because it also gives us control. Right? Instead of just changing the zoning where somebody can come in and build whatever they want as long as it fits in that zoning, by using the strong mayor and the mayor's directive, I was able to put parameters in place of exactly what that building is going to look like. How many parking spots, how many bicycle storage, um, ride share programs, like you said, Sam, grocery store, daycares, right. all these other things. So, so the amenities will be in that building to support the 1,264 units that are being built there. Right. So I wouldn't be able to do that without those mayor's directives. It would just be open up and, um, you know, sometimes you don't always see what you get. This allows me to make sure that what we see is what we get is what, what, we're, what we're sold. Mm -hmm. And Sam, you bring up a good point there. Um, working in communications and seeing our social media, the type of questions that we receive a lot or maybe the type of commentary that um, we receive on social media we aren't able to stipulate, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we can't say, hey, we really want this type of grocery store here, yep. right? Or we don't, we, we really want this type of store here. We didn't have the power as a town to do that, correct? Correct. Right. And, and that, you know, COVID, everything sort of went to e-commerce. And right. what we've got is a lot of warehousing space being built in Ajax. And people will comment sometimes and say, well, we want manufacturing, we want these other types of things, and mm -hmm. you're exactly right. We don't have that say. Right. We can't tell somebody what to build on their property. It's zone prestige employment, and prestige employment allows, you know, 40, 50 different uses, right. and one of those is warehousing. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I did do was was amend to remove self storage facilities and gas right. stations from prestige employment, because quite honestly, there we're not going to reach our employment targets with things like that. No, no disrespect to them. I mean, all good, but, but a self-storage facility might hire one or two people, but takes up a lot of space, where a other type of business might hire 200 people in that same number of space. Right. And same for gas stations. I mean, gas stations, we have lots of them. No disrespect to the oil companies. However, I mean, I do drive an electric car, and I think that's the way of the future. Uh, I think those sites, we're going to see the ones that we already have Again, they only hire one or two people, but are going to be redeveloped as we go forward because there's much higher, better uses for those lands now. Right. We have a fixed urban boundary. We cannot go out. We can only go up. Right. And thank you for explaining that because that's absolutely a very common question that we receive consistently, really, to be honest with you. Um, but I think maybe we can move on a little bit from the strong mayor powers here. And um, we very recently in January had a very exciting announcement about the Housing Accelerator yes. Fund. Could you maybe talk a little bit about what that was all about? Yeah. So we applied, and, and i got to give a lot of credit to staff on this because they, they did all the work on the applications towards the federal government. We made a few changes, like allowing um, four units as of right, right. and... Um, I think recommendations on um, increasing heights and densities and, and reducing parking in certain situations. And we received $22 million in housing accelerator funding. This is funding that's going to allow us to accelerate some projects um, and get that infrastructure in place to facilitate the significant growth that's coming. We don't want to be reactive. Okay, they built those two 60-story towers, for instance, and now all of a sudden we need a new community center, we need to do this, we need to do that. We want to get those things in place. That's going to allow us to accelerate some things like the fairground that we're, that we're building this year. Because right. where we usually hold our Canada Day and those other celebrations might not be available because that land will be developed. That's going to allow us to accelerate things like the Ajax Community Center expansion and revamp that's badly needed. I, I used to go there when I was a little kid. So it's, it's, it's an old building. It needs, it needs some, some updating. 
uh, and a number of other things. And one of the misconceptions I've seen off some of this online right. things is people think this is money going to developers. It's absolutely not going to developers. Uh, this is money that we can use based on an application process that we completed successfully to build infrastructure for the town of Ajax. And these are things that we're not going to have to go back um, to our capital budget for or to the taxpayer for. I, I appreciate the credit to staff, but I also want to throw in, um, in speaking with, with the ministry and, and with CMHC uh, through the application process, I think what really moved them was how forward thinking and uh, our council is and the leadership role that, that all of you really took in um, committing to getting housing built, because I know that that can be a, a challenging things at, at times, right? It's scary as communities change and, and start to grow up, but this council really has shown a lot of leadership in, in supporting that kind of density and change. Well, we just went through a municipal, municipal comprehensive review. It's taken six years. And we came up with a, at the region, a draft regional official plan, which has been sitting in Toronto, on in somewhere in the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing since May. Um, in that, there's a number of changes to certain zonings because, as I said, we, we can't go out, we can only go up. We recognize there's certain areas around our employment zones where high density is warranted so people can live and work very close proximity, not have to get in their cars, on major transit routes, and more affordable. A lot of people like, let's be honest, my kids, for instance, can't afford the $1.2 million ha homes we have here in Ajax, right? But they can probably buy a five or $600,000 condo. Also, right. we need a lot of rental space. There's been a lot of incentives for, for that type of thing. So we, uh, three years ago, made these recommendations and agreed to these, and then we tried everything we, we could to try and get them to move forward. I've, I've applied for minister zoning orders, which then turned into the CHIAs, the housing accelerators, then... Now, it, now it's a, a new thing that's coming. So we tried a lot of things to move these forward. Uh, the reason why I'm saying this is I, I also had our planning staff look at organically how many planning applications, how many residential applications did the planning department approve last year in 2023 just based on submissions? And that answer is about 3,400. Okay. Oh. Now, mm -hmm. that we control, approvals we control. But how many building permits were pulled? About 350, mm -hmm. only 10%. Mm -hmm. So we can't make the people build the buildings. We can only approve the, the applications where through these CHIAs we'd applied for, again, I can use the, the, the mayor's directive to say this is exactly what is going in these spaces. We got um, concept plans from the developers in these sort of key areas and we can make sure that you know what we see is what we get. And, and one of the conditions that I put on here is they need to have site plan in place in a year. Wow. Yep. Right? It's not we've approved these 3,500 or 3,400 this year, and they can sit indefinitely until a developer pulls a permit. By doing it the other way mm -hmm. and, and using the strong mayor directive and getting council support, now I can put a clock on that and say, no, you have to have it in. We can also use that, that directive to specify that there has to be affordable housing units in these areas as well, which is something we badly need. Right. And um, is there a definition of affordable housing yet, or is that something that's still being worked on? It's still being worked on. Right. Uh, Big City Mayors has actually put something forward to the province and the federal government requesting that they, they define what right. affordable is. So that'll come from the provincial government then, most likely. At some point, yeah. Right. Okay. And um, with that, I think there was some other exciting news in January that I think we can discuss a little. And um, you're going to be chair of the Durham Region Police Board again for another still, year. Still, yeah. Still. I was, um, yes, thanks to the, my, my colleagues on the board. They reelected me for another term, which is, which is very good. I appreciate right. their support. We've had a very busy year. We started with all new leadership by hiring the new chief right. last year. Peter right. Marrera has worked out uh, very, very well. And just really quickly, um, with the new police chief, we actually held another Live with Mayor Collier event um, in 2023 in October, yep. and the police chief came out. And if anybody who's watching or listening would be interested in that Live with Mayor, we do have the recording up on our channels. It's at ajax.ca slash mth. Mm -hmm. He's been great. And, and what I wanted when we were looking to hire was I wanted a change agent. I wanted somebody to come in identify what the issues are, shake things up, make the difficult choices, 
and revamped the organization. And that's exactly what he's done. We then further went and hired two new deputy chiefs, which um, the first one has just started, the second one is starting shortly, and um, developed the, to, oh, what is this tagline? Together, growing together or something. And it's the whole, our new strategic plan is in place. And uh, I think we we're, we're, have sort of laid the groundwork for some really great things to come. So I really appreciate the support of the board in reaffirming me as chair going forward for another year. I think we've had a great start, and I'm really looking forward to, to what this next year brings. There is uh, a little surprise coming that I hope to make an announcement in the not too distant future. Oh. We'll have to stay tuned for that for certain. And um, we receive a lot of questions in general from residents about community safety. Mm -hmm. And so I think this makes sense to talk about while talking about being chair of the police board. Um, and some of those topics that come up might be homelessness, traffic. Um, would you may maybe be able to talk about what the town is doing to address these issues? Uh, I can. Part of the, some of the changes I made in the budget this year was I took out some things that were not effective, like the traffic calming measures that we were putting in place, some of these bollards that we have mm -hmm. to put in in the spring and take and out take in the out. fall, and they, they don't really have much change. I mean, we, we monitor and we know the things that work and the things that really don't work. Right. The thing we know that works is the automatic speed enforcement, the photo radar. It's, it's, it's effective over 40%. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I know of that really works. We made an investment a couple of years ago. Um, due to limitations with the Joint Processing Center, we were only allowed to run them for a very short period because we would have overwhelmed the Processing Center. Um, that has now increased. Uh, as has last June, Council approved going from 12, I think it was, might have been 15, community safety zones to expanding it to a 30-ish. And so we're going to be expanding the program across the town. So because it's been so effective in slowing people down. So we have three cameras, we rotate them through every month or two, and um, they, they work well. At the same time, we're developing what's called an AMPS program. Don't ask me what that's an acronym <laughs> for, um, something administration, but the AMPS program is something that the provincial government, um, the justice minister has asked us to do, and that is our own internal processing department at the town now. So instead of going through the provincial courts at the region, where we don't receive any of the fine revenues, like none. We absorb the cost of having the units and all the work that goes involved. But we don't get the money for it. Having the AMPS program here means we can deal with this all internally. Um, we will get the revenue for it. That's non-tax revenue, which helps me at tax time, uh, as well as slows people down and, and increases community safety. It's sort of a win-win-win with that respect. Right. And um I think it's administrative monetary penalties. I think that's that, what it that stands is for. What it is, yes. yes. Um, and Sam, you've been pretty involved in the ASE file. Is there anything that you would like to bring up about ASE? <laughs> well, I think one thing um, that's a, a common misconception, and, and we've been talking about it recently, is mm -hmm. that it's just a cash grab. But maybe you can start by telling us where ASE cameras can be located. Sure. Well, they can only be located in community safety zones. Yeah. So generally, those are around schools. That's, that's pretty much all of them. There's one or two exceptions, which are sort of high traffic areas where we know that we get a lot of speeding through. You, you see also the mobile boards as well, the speed yes. boards. Um, part of the change that, that we will just have just approved is they don't have to be tied together. We don't have to have the speed boards where the automatic speed enforcement cameras are. So we're going to be splitting those up because they are not as, of effect, as effective, but they are still effective. So we'll be moving all those speed boards around town as well, again, to, to help with community safety and, and to slow people down. As far as the cash grab, um, it costs us money to have these cameras. I mean, mm -hmm. the program costs, I think, $300,000 a year. I'm happy just to break even. It's not a cash grab. I right. just want to break even on this because it's all about community safety and slowing people down. It's not about generating revenue. So my goal is this is the, the program pays for itself. Now, going forward, um, I know we've discussed that it would be nice for municipalities, and, and I'm hearing this from other municipalities as well, but it'd be nice for municipalities to have their own say in, in rules around automated speed enforcement. It would. Unfortunately, we have, well, not unfortunately, <laughs> we are subject to the Highway Traffic Act, mm -hmm. and the Highway Traffic Act sets out exactly how these have to work, that we have to post 90 days in advance before we put an automatic speed enforcement camera in right. place notice on the road 90 days in advance that this is coming. 
even though there's marked 40 kilometer an hour speed zone, even though there's a school, even though there's crossing guards, um, we still have to give 90 days advance notice before. That, that really limits. I mean, I'm not aware when the police do their radar that they put up a notice advising people. I don't think they do. <laughs> but um, but uh, we have to do that. Yeah. I mean, I think I understand, but I, I think that can be relaxed. That, that would be helpful. I mean, that, but that we do have to follow those rules. Right. And um, we chatted quite a bit there about traffic, but um, I want to remain on the topic of community safety. And um, I know you spoke about this at your last live with Mayor, um, really quite at length um, with the Chief of Police. But there has been a rise in visible homelessness in the region and yeah. in Ajax. And I think um, our residents would like to hear a little bit more about um, what's going on there and um, what the town's doing. Well, it falls under the purview of the region. Right. So we have worked with the region and we have leased the region one of our buildings, a surplus building, which is the old sales center for the Lamine development, to be used as a 30 bed shelter. Um, so they operate it, they fund it, it's, it's in Ajax, but it's something that, that they take care of. We are working with the region who heads all this up in, as much as we can. Um, I don't know what else we can do. I mean, it's unfortunate, but it, it's a much bigger, bigger thing. 30% of all the calls that Durham Regional Police receive are not police calls. They're, they're mental health, addiction, homelessness, all these other type of social things that, that don't fall under the purview of the town of Ajax. So we have to work with them. One of the things we just dealt with last week was a... Um, a motion to create a non-police-led response unit, which means if a call comes in, it's a mental health issue. You don't want to tie up a couple of police cars and 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 you know a bunch of bunch of officers when this is actually something that requires much more expertise in, in a different field, being mental health. Right. Um, so what this new program, which is going to, a pilot, is going to be, is to have non-police go in and deal with some of these mental health calls. Now, it's a bit of a slippery slope because how do you make sure that there's no violence going to be involved, right? And you have to make So I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work, but we're looking at different things to be able to free up the police to do what they need to do, right. um, which is keeping us safe and, and handling the high-priority calls, as well as getting the people, whether they be homeless, whether they have addiction or whatever other issues, the help that they need as well. It's a very difficult situation. It's very expensive. I s talked earlier about, you know, the million dollars a month it's costing us to home the, the refugees and asylum seekers. That doesn't include the money we're spending at the region for the homeless side of things. Uh, Whitby just opened 1635 Dundas. The region just bought that building, opened that. There's uh, Oshawa, of course, has, has their facilities run by the region, but I think every municipality in, the munis in, in Durham has to step up because this is not an Ajax issue or a Whippy issue or this is a Canada issue. Right. It's everywhere. I can't remember a city I've been to in the last couple of years where I haven't seen homeless people everywhere. So it, it, is, it is a very complex issue. We're doing the best we can. The region I know is doing a lot um, for the individual, whether that's, you know, their housing programs to, to get them housed or into shelter, um, or their street outreach teams right. that they have, again, looking after the individual. But I know that the impacts of homelessness are also on the community around it. And that's where I see um, Ajax Council and Ajax stepping in a lot. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the changes we've seen in security in the town. Well, and, and the costs are very real. Well, we, one thing I just was reminded of, we've had some cold weather, so we've been opening up our community center for warming centers. So we've been doing that. But the costs that we've been incurring, so in Oshawa and in Whitby, the region of Durham is paying their costs for security, for cleanup, for all these things, up to $500,000, um, co-paying. Last year, our costs in Ajax were a little over $500,000 yet we are not receiving the regional funding for that. We are absorbing that through our budget. That's a problem. There needs to be a solution, and, and I understand a policy is coming forward from the region shortly, which will make it fair for everybody, so it's not gonna just be Whitby and Oshawa being reimbursed. Um, I'm gonna be directing staff to send them a bill for our 500,000 last year, because I, I think it, you know, we, we should be compensated as well. Right. 
and our residents shouldn't be shouldn't be footing the bill for for the for regional responsibilities. Right, and um, it's not even that. Um, it's not just the funding coming from the town, but the Ajax Mayor Scala um, has also put funding um, as well. Can you maybe speak to some of those programs and how much money? Yeah, well, the gala is, this will be the sixth year. So in the first five years, we've we've netted out at just over a million dollars has gone oh. back into the community. It's, we probably raised well over one and a half, but after expenses, everything, it's been a little over a million. And we've directed quite a bit of that towards the Salvation Army. We had our mm -hmm. locker program. We bought the community vehicle. We funded the, the big commercial teaching kitchen. A number of other things that are specifically geared towards the homeless um, to try and assist there. We've also helped a lot of the other type organizations like hospice, for instance, mm -hmm. and, and Feed the Need and, and Joanne's House, which is for youth homeless yep. and, and a number of other things. So we've done what we can, but I don't think money is gonna buy us out of this problem. Right. We, we've assisted, um, but um, yeah, it, it's gonna take everybody stepping up. Right, and um, for everybody again listening um, here, we do have a dedicated webpage that speaks to quite a bit of what we just spoke about. And for anybody who's interested, the friendly URL for that is ajax.ca slash homelessness. Um, and all of that is there and Sam, if, um, Residents do have questions or concerns. Do they have resources that they could reach out to? Absolutely. So I was going to say one of the great things about that page is there's a lot of contact information that's available there for um, what to do when you're when you're recognizing the impacts of homelessness uh, in all kinds of different situations, right. whether that be somebody from the town that you need to contact or somebody from the region. So it's it's a really good uh, starting point for somebody who's looking for that kind of support information. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And um, we're getting into 2024 here, which means that we're just one year um, into this council term. So Mayor Collier, um, maybe to switch gears a little bit in the conversation here, could you maybe share what um, you think our greatest accomplishments have been so far this term or any exciting initiatives that you would really like to spotlight? Well, at the start of each term, we do a strategic plan. Right. We develop a strategic plan, kind of here's where we are, here's where we want to be over the next four years, and these are the things we have to do step by step by step to reach our goals. Uh, we've been doing that ever since I started. Okay. So six, six. What was it, 2003? Those. 2003, yeah. so there's been six now. And that really helps because if you don't have a plan, you, you don't know really what you're going to do. And mm -hmm. um, so far, we, it, it takes about the first year to sort of get the groundwork in place to get a lot of these right. things done, which we've done. Um, as far as achievements, I'll look, I'll look to the mayor's budget as one because I think that was, was significant. Being able to bring in um, uh, a fairly, I'll call it reasonable, small increase, but still do all the things we need to do is not easy. That's going to enable us to move a lot of this, these things forward. I, I'll say I think it's a significant achievement because I've got to get all of council to support it, which isn't, yep. isn't that easy. And, and as the residents as well. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a balancing act, but we're, we're very early in the term to see mm -hmm. sort of the, the large things. But I, as I said a couple of times, we're right on the cusp of massive growth. Um, I don't know if I'll see all that while I'm still mayor, but, but I'm expecting a lot of shovels in the ground in right. 2024 and 2025. I'm expecting us to be well on our way to meeting our 17,000 unit housing pledge that we've made to the province. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm looking forward to providing the infrastructure and the resources and the housing that we badly need in Ajax. Right. And um, again, I'm going to kind of provide the resources here for everybody listening. If they want to look into a little bit more detail into that strategic plan, for example, um, these strategic plans do go forward publicly at council meetings. Um, I believe it was March 2023 or 2022? 2023. 2023. Um, and the fulsome report is there. And then at ajax.ca slash action 26, the plan is called action 26 as the term goes to 2026. Um, all the pillars are there um, and all the actions that we're looking to complete this term are all available publicly online for anybody who's interested. I'll also say about that strategic plan too and, and the title that council picked for it, that Action mm -hmm. 26, um, related a lot to the fact that a lot of planning happened last term. Yep. A lot of, of those like stepping stones were put in place um, 
But this term really is when we expect to see the action and those big changes happen. Yeah, and last year, a lot of the planning that happened and a lot of the results was commercial, um, commercial development. This time, we're gonna see a lot of residential development, which we need. Um, but it also allows us to sort of measure as well. I think last term we achieved, was it 97%? Of target. I think it was 100%. Was it, I, I think, was it 100? I think, yeah, I think it was 100. Well, okay, yeah. I knew it was a high number, <laughs> uh, which which is good because again, that, that allows us to measure exactly where we were. And and right. the good thing about having a plan is, I mean, you 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 can change it if you're getting off target or if, if the situation changes, like COVID last last term, right. we were able to make those adjustments to keep moving forward. Right, it's true. And um, we are getting closer to a little bit of um, the end of our session here today. And is there anything that you really wanted to share with listeners or re and our residents that we didn't talk about? Um, anything I didn't bring up? And there might be a lot. <laughs> there might be. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I get a little bit frustrated with some of the um, inaccuracies I see online from right. time to time. Like, I mean, go to the website. The resources are mm -hmm. all there. The information's all there. Like the half funding, for instance. I was seeing comments about developers getting the money. Right. That, completely untrue. I mean, these are, these are very simple, simple things. Even a Google search of half funding will tell you the developers aren't getting the money. Mm -hmm. I mean, take the time. Do, attend our meetings. Like, they're, okay. they're not always a lot of fun. Sometimes they're <laughs> a little, little, little dry. But... There's a lot of good information there. Like, read the agendas. The, the budget is very important. Um, I, you know, we had a couple of people come and speak at the budget this year. Um, we, we didn't see eye to eye on some things because some of the, some of the things that came across just weren't, uh, that's not how it works. But, but I'm always happy to get the input and the feedback because I don't know everything. I do the best I can, but I'm always happy to listen to somebody who has a better way of doing things. But mm -hmm. at least get educated, get informed. Right. Um, by, by getting involved. And the town has a great customer service team too. So when they you do. have questions, um, you know, those questions can be sent off to the right department, the right people. You can reach out to your counselors. I know our, our members of council get an awful lot of emails from residents uh, with, with questions and that's great. I mean, I'd much rather see them coming to the source than yep. asking it into the, the social media into void. The ether, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Absolutely. Sam, did you, is there anything you think I missed today that um, you think residents might want to hear a little bit more about from Mayor Collier? You know, I think that there's a lot of really exciting changes that are happening in the town. Um, I know right now is a period of, of a lot of um, anger and questions and change. So I think it's, it's nice to reflect on all of these positive things that, that we've talked about today um, and the positive changes that they're gonna have for the, the future residents of Ajax. I know right now when you, when you hear change, it, it can be a scary thing, but to know that um, all these new services and, and things like the fairgrounds that you were talking about, mm -hmm. um, new density where you know, our kids and grandkids mm -hmm. can, can move in, um, updating, some really aging um, infrastructure. infrastructure. I know that was a big part of your budget. Yep. Um, a lot of that was just going to, to keeping up the infrastructure that we have. Uh, so I think all of those are really positive things for us to reflect on as we, as we head into this year. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and again, with this growth, we're gonna have to be prepared for it. We've, we've done some other things, like we expanded our senior snow removal program. That was a big one. Again, we, we have done quite an expansion of our snow removal program as a whole. I kind of wish it would snow more this year. It's been a light year, but <laughs> I mean, we're ready for it because that was one of the things the residents said is we, we need it cleared faster. We, we need to get I'm this gonna done. I'm going to knock on wood. So I know. We, that made me nervous. We there. I don't increase want service levels to accommodate those types of yeah. things. There is a cost attached to that. But like, remember, our councillors, we're all taxpayers as well. Right? And, and it's uh, like I look at this as I look at my own budget type of thing. It, but I maybe just understand it a little bit better, but there's, there's reasons behind all of these things. And I just, again, ask residents to just get informed on, on what those reasons are. Um, I talked a little bit about how, you know, decisions we make this year affect next year and future. Um, capital budgets aren't linear because there's different projects each year. So some years are gonna be more, some years are gonna be less. Uh, my goal is to make those capital funds in our savings, just like we would with our RSPs and our savings account, we want the highest growth we can get. 
same thing for our investments made in the town. And that, that's sort of where my focus is. At the same time, with the growth, um, yes, we're going to be creating the residential units we need. We're creating the business and corporations we need. That's also, also increasing our tax base, which right. is, again, how we take the, the need to go back to the taxpayer in such a large way out of it is by growing that tax base, bringing in new and, have, and dividing up the pie more. So it's a complex thing, but we, we do our best. And um, I guess just before we wrap up here, I do want to do a quick plug. And um, last year was the first annual mayor and council barbecue. Mm -hmm. And so I do just want to get that save the date out there for everyone. And um, this year, mayor and council barbecue is going to be Saturday, June 1st. And it's a great opportunity to get out and meet your local elected officials um, in a little bit more casual and fun environment, right? Yeah. And that's free for the community. Um, there might be some registration details, but um, it's absolutely free, and we all hope to see you, see you there. And we did sell out last year. You're right. Mm -hmm. And even though it wasn't good weather, we did. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mayor Collier, for joining uh, myself and Sam here today. We really appreciate your time, and um, we hope to do another one of these soon. I'm always happy to be here. Thank you for joining us today for the Live with Mayor Collier 2024 podcast edition. If you have any questions or feedback about our show, you can email corporate at ajax.ca. Thank you for listening. It's available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and on our webpage at ajax.ca slash mth.